The last thing I'd like to show you from this topic is binding energy per nucleon. So this is, um, this is how much binding energy, uh, in other words, how much energy is released for every nucleon. There's a nice uh, way to graph this, and it actually tells you a lot of things about how natural processes might work. So I'm going to show you this uh, big graph right here. I'm going to make it really big so we can see it here like this. And I'm going to say uh, this will be the binding energy per nucleon. And this right here is going to be uh, then, well, if I want the nucleon number, uh, that's otherwise known as the mass number. Okay, so I'll say that so this is otherwise known as mass number. If you remember, uh, when we were looking at uh, elements, you know, we had something like this right here. This right here is what we're looking at here. This is the number of nucleons here. Okay, so um, we don't care about the number of protons, we care about the number of nucleons. Turns out this can tell us some really neat stuff here. So, uh, I just want to make sure you can actually see that. Uh, that might be off the screen, so I just want to make sure. There we go. So that's what we're looking at here, is A. That's what we're trying to put on this x-axis. Now there's a graph that you're supposed to know about uh, how it looks, and it actually really helps to, to know a little bit about what it does. Um, my trick for drawing this thing is, I mean, I call this the whale. Now this might seem really, really silly. I haven't heard of anybody else ever calling it that, but it does something like this right here. And the reason I call this the whale is because I sort of imagine that this thing right here looks a little bit like, if I just draw it up here like this, I imagine it looks like a big giant whale here. You know, if it looks like, a, you know, if there's a, you know, one of these big, I think it's called a humpback whale or something like that. So one of these big whales like that, I imagine that that's what this looks like. Uh, not really, but at least this helps me to remember it. It's important to know that it goes up like this, it has a peak, and then it goes down a lot shallower. It turns out it goes uh, like this. Now, uh, what's important to know is where this peak actually lies. This peak lies at a very special number, 56. The reason is that this is actually iron 56. That's the key thing right here, is that we have iron 56. That it seems to be the one with the highest binding energy per nucleon. Now, what does this actually do for us? So, you know, what is this actually helping us with? Well, this is going to help us to know, first of all, um, if fusion or if fission are energetically favorable. Remember, now lower numbers, those are going to be things like hydrogen is over here and helium. I mean, this really, this goes in order of all the elements here. So heavier elements are over here, the lighter stuff is here. In reality, there's a few little blips with this curve, but it basically does something like this. So the key thing to know is that iron 56 is the highest you can have. And actually, this is kind of neat. You'll see uh, in a second that this actually explains some neat things with the sun. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is show you this little curve right here. Draw this, and I'm going to say fusion. And over here, I'm going to draw this one and say fission. Now the key thing here is that a reaction is favorable. So there's two different types of reactions. You can have fusion or you can have fission. Now the key thing is that a reaction is energetically favorable. In other words, you know, it wants to happen easily if the reactants, uh, sorry, if the products, so that's like the, the end result of your um, reaction that you have, if the products have a higher binding energy per nucleon than the reactant. In other words, you always want to do a, a reaction, or not you, but physics, science, I mean, this is just what happens naturally and easily, is if you have the reactants um, which have a lower binding energy per nucleon than the products. In other words, if you're going to make something, it helps if the things you make have a higher binding energy per nucleon. So the way I remember this is that it's like things always want to aspire to the top here. So if you start off with like uranium-238, it's only going to have fission, and it's only going to make lighter things if it's, uh, the, react the reactants, 
which is the uranium here, have a lower binding energy than the uh, products, which is whatever you end up making. Same thing here. You start off with heli uh, sorry, hydrogen, let's say. Hydrogen has a very low binding energy per nucleon, and it'll only get made easily if the reactant, which is hydrogen, is lower binding energy than the product, which in this case would be helium. So basically, it only makes these reactions easily if the result gives you a higher binding energy per nucleon. That's why we point this way and say fusion. In other words, in order to make elements from zero all the way up to, uh, well, iron 56, fusion is the main way to make these things. And then this one right here, you could say fission. Fission tends to happen only in things that start from over here, let's say, and bring them in. So now you might be wondering, well, what, is, what does that do? What does that help? Well, that explains a lot of things. Uh, first of all, um, it can explain what happens in the sun. The sun is actually a big fusion reactor. And that means the sun is continually making you know, hydrogen to helium. And eventually, when the sun runs out of a lot of hydrogen, it's going to actually have helium in the center, and it's going to be burning that and making heavier elements. And stars, as far as we know, they can only sort of naturally, in these regular processes, make elements all the way up to iron 56. It seems like iron and anything lower, those are made in stars. Um, and then you need some other weird processes to make anything heavier than that. Then you might think, well, then how in the world do we get these other elements? Because uh, this is going a bit into astrophysics, but that's also my passion, so uh, sorry. But I think this has a really good example and a really good tie-in with astrophysics. So you might be wondering then, great, so if stars make every element, you know, from uh, hydrogen all the way up to iron, what in the world makes things heavier than that? Well, then what you have to do is, um, I mean, it's not energetically favorable, but it's still possible. So, for example, in a supernova, if a star actually blows up, uh, when it blows up, there's lots of extra energy there, and then it can actually make these heavier things. So it's thought that pretty much all of the uh, elements heavier than iron, and in fact, lots of iron, those are all only made from supernova explosions. So when you hear the saying uh, you know, that says that we're all made of stardust, uh, we actually think that's exactly the case. For example, in our blood, we have lots of iron, right? I mean, all that stuff came from a star. The hydrogen and helium and all this stuff that makes me... Um, well, hydrogen and helium seems to have been present in the early universe, but pretty much anything after helium uh, all the way up to iron, most of it, we think, was made in stars. So that's kind of neat. That explains why stars like to make fusion all the way up to iron 56. And as far as we know, this seems to be the case. So um, what I'd like to just point out here is that it's key to understanding if you're going to have fusion or fission. And it's all about if it's energetically favorable. In other words, fusion likes to happen you know, from something here going over this way, which means it goes up the hill, so to speak, here. So fusion happens here. Fission happens over here. Well, that's it for this topic.